Good evening, everybody. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on the Swiss artist Lil Chudi. My name is Alexandra Barzal. I am curator here at the Graphische Sammlung ETH Zurich, where I am responsible for graphic art of the 20th and 21st century. And I will be leading through the next hour. The webinar takes place in the context of the current exhibition, Lil Judy, the excitement of the modern liner cut in our showroom. The Graphische Sammlung, ETH Zurich is the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology's collection of prints and drawings. It is one of the largest collections in this field in Switzerland, containing some 160,000 artworks on paper from the 15th century to the present day. Among them are also 20 liner cuts by Lil Chudi. Some of them are now on display whereby the focus of the exhibition is clearly on the works from the 1930s and 40s, which are presented here very integrally for the first time. The show brings together iconic master prints as well as unknown sheets, sketches and linoleum plates, but also examples of applied graphics and children's illustrations. It features previously unpublished material from Judy's estate and loans from several institutions and private collections, shedding new light on her life and her work. You can get a small impression from the installation view in my background. Lil Judy born 1911, daughter of a merchant family from the rural Swiss canton. Um, moved to London in 1929 to be educated at the Grosvenor School of Modern Art. She flourished in the vibrating metropolis of the interwar years and soon gained wide recognition for her bold and often colorful modernist liner cuts. Yet in her native Switzerland, she has largely fallen in the oblivion. It was and it is our concern with our exhibition project to secure this extraordinary artist the place she deserves in Swiss cultural consciousness and to bring her work into the present. For this reason, the question today will be what significance Lil Judy's modernist work could still have today. Together, we will try to situate her over in its time and to explain the reasons for the popularity of her works then and as we shall see nowadays. And to this purpose, we have invited the following distinguished guests who can undoubtedly contribute essential clues to these questions and who I would like to introduce briefly. It is first of all, Jennifer. She is curator um, of, in the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. There she is responsible for modern and contemporary prints, illustrated and artist's books. She joined the department in 2014 after holding curatorial positions at the Yale University Art Gallery, the University of Virginia and the Whitney Museum of American Independent Study Program. At the Met, she has curated different shows, among others, World War I and the Visual Arts that was for 2017. We were able to engage Jennifer as the author of an elabor elaborate text on the special position of Lil Judy within the Grover School and a strong connection to Claude Flight in our catalogue. As a specialist in British modernist printmaking, however, she is above all the editor of this catalogue here. Maybe one can see Modern Times British Prints 1913 until 1939, which was published last autumn on the occasion of the big show of the, of the same name at the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Museum, which are 
also, which she also curated. She will certainly tell us more about this amazing project and it included some great sheets by Lil Judy from the museum's own collection. Well, I would like, uh, I would also like to introduce Gordon Samuel. He is a specialist in modern British art and co-owner of the Osborne Samuel Gallery in London. Gordon was previously director, a partner at the Redfern Gallery with its regular liner cut exhibitions. The gallery helped to establish the great reputation of the group of artists around the Grobener School as early as the 1930s. 2004, Gordon founded with Peter Osborne, the Osborne Samuel Gallery. The gallery is today one of London's leading specialists in modern British painting and sculpture as well as specializing in rare, in rare 20th century British prints and is the leading international dealer in the liner cuts of the Grosvenor School. In 2019, Gordon curated the biggest ever museum exhibition of British modernist print, prints at the Dulwich Picture Gallery in London. In the accompanying catalog, he offers a fascinating view on the work and lives of the Grosvenor School artists, explore the innovate, innovative um, practice of this group and the radical interwar years in which they all were working. Also on board today is my colleague Marcel Just, with whom I'm curated exhibition at the Grafische Sammlung. He lives and works in Zurich as a freelance curator. He has realized several extensive exhibition projects and regularly published texts on cultural and architectural history. Across the liner cuts of Lil Chudi, he came in the late 1980s. Since then, he has acquired an extensive knowledge of her work and he was a tireless um, tireless collaborator in all our research in the run-up to the exhibition. So I think we can all be more than curious about what our guests will say. Perhaps a few words about the course of the event. Each of us will give short input presentations in turn. These inputs will be followed by an exchange between the discussion partners. If there are any questions from the forum, please use the Q&A function. We will be happy to address selected questions at the end of the webinar. The webinar will be recorded and can be played back afterwards. Well, I would like to start our conversation with a picture that struck me last week when I was reading the newspaper. Um, it is a scene I it is a scene that immediately reminded me of Lil Chudi's liner cuts. Lil Chudi was also a passionate photographer herself. Some of the photos are in our exhibition as well as in the catalog. However, this photograph was not taken by her, but by Margaret Burke White, the famous American photographer and photojournalist was an exceptional talent becoming more successful than some of her male colleagues. Beginning in 1930, she was sent to the Soviet Union and on assignment, becoming the first Western photographer allowed into that country. In 1935, she joined the newly created Life magazine and for years and series of spectacular photographs of remarkable events around the world. Now, her photograph is titled Heads in the Garments District and was taken in New York in 1930. The picture captures the view from a Manhattan skyscraper down to the street. Burke White wanted to catch a different, uh, special view of the big city here. She, she, she shows the everyday happenings from a new perspective. What is indeed striking, no one seems to be out and about without a hat. However, you have to look at the scene twice to see exactly what has been photographed. People are standing here on the street individually and in groups. They talk, 
walk past, gesticulate, they form patterns, reveal individual streams in the gathering. It is this anonymous crowd, seemingly uniform, but with a life of its own, that made me think of some of line of uh, to these line of cuts. Take, for example, the village fair or national vote. Here, as there, people passing by on passing by and onlookers are an essential part of the dense pictorial compositions. Probably Lil Judy would also have liked Burke White's photograph very much. Perhaps she had even known it. Her photos appeared in numerous magazines and Lil Judy was a diligent recycler of pictorial material from the most diverse media as it turned out in the form of an accordion book which came to light during our research, the artist cut out motifs from the dazzling magazine world of the time, collected, collected them, pasted them in, and thus created an actual sound of images, mainly of bodies in motion. This leporello can be seen as the central key to Lil Judy's early work from the 1930s and 40s. Quite obviously, these samples served her as an inspiration for several linocats. Here, Judy systematically arranges the cutouts according to themes. The focus of the compendium is, in, is on collections of figure images, uh, panopticum of typical human move movements, posture and gestures. Here, Judy's fascination for the variety of forms comes to the fore, whether widely dancing in a circle or marching in an impeccable rows, whether next to or stacked on top of each other. The people here are suspended in a mostly strict order that dominates the respective impulses. What impresses me greatly about Lil Judy's works she does not allow herself to be overwhelmed or even deterred by what was generally perceived as the, at the time as a new, highly fragmented, even alienated modern reality, as was the case with many of her contemporaries. Quite the opposite. Image by image, cut by cut, she resolutely makes her way through the visual and even acoustic distortions of modernity and captures numerous unforgettable motives with an alert eye and a great deal of joie de vivre. And what, that's what, why I am convinced that her uniquely dynamic, colorful pictorial world will outlast her time and even ours. Well, that would be a little intro from my side if you don't mind and don't have, it, have any comment, comments, maybe we will move on directly to Gordon. What do you think? Well, I prepared a, a little note here and let me, <clears throat> let me go through it and then it can, we can pick up points from it. So I was saying that this, this webinar uh, is called What is the Significance of Lil Shudi's Work Today? Well, today we, we have the opportunity of hindsight uh, to look back and, uh, and assess her work from the 1930s to the end of her life. She's known primarily for her a dynamic um, post-Cubo futurist liner cuts, a technique that she learned from her great friend and her mentor, Claude Flight, at the Grosvenor School of Modern Art. These lithographs date from 1930 to 1950. These are the ones in, in Stephen Koppel's catalogue resume. However, there's far less interest uh, for the abstract works, uh, also in Linocus that she produced in her later career. Commercially, the work of the 1930s fetch significant prices compared to the abstract works. Uh, it continues to be significant today as her work is part of a group that was hardly known, um, hardly known until the discovery, rediscovery in the 1970s by my old friend Michael Parkin, who began the revival of interest in the liner cuts of the Grosvenor School with an exhibition of liner cuts of uh, Edith Lawrence in 1973. 
These liner cuts of the Grosvenor School of Modern Art, uh, the technique used, the images made, are unique in the, in the history of printmaking. And Lil Shudi was a significant part of this group that included Claude Flight himself, Sybil Andrews, Cyril Power, William Greengrass, and Eileen Mayo in the UK. There was a plethora of others, but these are the best known. Uh, and then there was Ethel Spouse, Evelyn Syme, and Dorrit Black in Australia. Uh, all three women attended classes at the school and promoted the work of the group in their native Australia. However, Lil's work was probably and still is practically unknown in her native Switzerland and in Europe generally. And I personally suspect that a major reason is that the work of the Grosvenor School during the 1930s wasn't exhibited in Europe at all. Uh, British art during this modernist period was probably looked upon as somewhat parochial, you know, apart from Henry Moore and, um, you know, Ben Nicholson. However, uh, her work as part of the Grosvenor School is significantly known in the English-speaking world and included in the collections of all the major international museums, including the British Museum and, uh, and the Victoria and Albert Museum, who acquired work uh, way back in the 1930s. In later years, the Metropolitan Museum and MoMA in New York, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and Mickey Wilson's Wilsonian Foundation in Miami Beach in Florida have built important collections, including uh, Lil's work. Uh, Australia and New Zealand museums also have significant collections, mainly thanks to gifts by Rex Nankerville in the 1950s to New Zealand and Australia, where there is a, a wing of the National Library of Australia named after him. Um, there were, uh, and there, is a, in, in, there were insightful print curators like Pat Gilmore, who joined the Australian National Gallery from the Tate, and Stephen Coppel, uh, her successor, who wrote the definitive catalogue resume of seven of the most prominent artists of the Grosvenor School, including Lil Shudi. So why are these liner cuts still significant today? Why do they continue to attract uh, such appreciative audiences at every exhibition and art fair that I've ever shown them at? I curated an exhibition at the Dulwich Picture Gallery in the summer of 2019, thankfully before COVID struck. Uh, apparently it had the best attended summer exhibition in the museum's history. Uh, Dulwich Picture Gallery was the world's first purpose-built picture gallery built in 1812. It, uh, the exhibition that I curated had 90,000 visitors and the catalogue was reprinted three times during the exhibition. I also believe that this, this wonderful new monograph uh, from Zurich on, on Lil's work and career will also add a great deal to her significance as a thoroughly accomplished artist uh, with an international reputation. So what is the attraction of this work? Hopefully our discussion uh, will enlighten us. Now, I've written a few things um, on, on five prints. If I, may I continue? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we start with, with the underground here and um, Lil uh, arrived in London in December, 1929 uh, to attend Claude Flight's classes in liner cutting. She'd seen advertisements in, in the, the studio magazine and was encouraged by her mother. Uh, she traveled to London and uh, she was to become Flight's favorite student and close friend, and Claude and his partner, Edith Lawrence, until his death in 1955. This is Lil's fourth liner cut, and like her first race in Switzerland of 1930, it appears to be quite simple, rather naive composition, quite childlike, more like an exercise in liner cutting. The subject of the London Underground uh, is one that immediately is that one immediately associates with the liner cuts of Lil's fellow student Cyril Power. Lil is mentioned in, in this new book uh, that came out in November by Jenny Uglo uh, called Sybil and Cyril Cutting Through Time, but there's no mention of a friendship with, with Sybil or Cyril. However, I, I suppose that one could speculate that the young Lil, 39 years younger than Power, might have been encouraged or influenced by him to try the underground as a subject. It's, it's, it's an absolutely charming print, but it's lacking the, the sophistication uh, of her work of just a few, few, few years later. So here we have uh, one of my favorite prints, 
which is fixing the wires. Uh, and I've chosen this liner cutter of Shudi's, as, as I say, it's my favorite. It was made in 1932, well, when Lil was not quite 21. I've often wondered if the image was inspired by um, C.R. Nevinson's Nerves of an Army from 1918, uh, which depicts four royal engineers repairing the telegraph lines of communication. She was no doubt aware of Nevinson as a leading English futurist of the pre- and post-war years. In Shudi's Leinecke, we see two electric telegraph workers strapped in their safety harnesses, uh, repairing the trailing wires. The French workers, uh, as Lil was attending classes given by André Lotte in Paris in 1931. Uh, she also studied under Gino Savrini and Fernand Léger. So Lil was a protégé uh, of her friend and tutor in the Grove School of Modern Art called Flight. In fact, he was so taken by uh, this print um, that he selected it, he selected Fixing the Wires to illustrate it in his very influential, te influential textbook called The Art and Craft of Liner Cutting and Printing, which was published in, in 1934. Unusually, Shudi has uh, finally cut through the liner block, leaving these white lines of the wires and the limited color palette whereas Flight's teaching practice was to use blocks of color. Um, it was printed in an edition of 50 from three blocks. The image proved so successful that in 1937, she began a second edition of 50, specifically for the American market. Guards, now, um, this is a liner cut of 1936. Here we have a dynamic image of the, the band of the Coldstream Guards. Uh, you see three drummers at the rear in their red coats and their tall black bearskin hats uh, taking part in the changing of the guards at Buckingham Palace, which is a, a huge tourist attraction. Sadly, it's been cancelled during these COVID days. It shows Lil's familiarity with London life, her, her mastery of, of the liner cut process, uh, her quest for dynamic subjects with sort of flight centre out to, to look at which in this case conveys the, you can see the forward movement of the guards as they walk in step. You can almost sort of hear the music. Here we see her advanced degree of sophistication in this Leinecke with the bowl shapes of the red and black uniforms and the carefully left and uncut areas uh, of white of the drummer's sashes and the drums themselves. Ah, now this is rather good street decoration. Um, being a Londoner, I've, I've chosen another London subject. This is a uh, street decoration. Lil and her sister, uh, Adri, visited, uh, or they stayed with Flight and his, uh, and his partner, Edith, in their cramped studio in Rob Martin Mews in 1935, uh, specifically to attend the, the sixth exhibition of British liner cut at the Ward Gallery in Baker Street. The annual exhibitions started at the Redfern in, in 1929, and they moved to the Ward Gallery after uh, a disagreement over payment uh, between Flight and Rex Nankovo, who ran the Red Fair. The visit coincided with a national celebrations for the Silver Jubilee of King George V, when the streets were festooned with red, white, and blue decorations and the Union Jack everywhere. Uh, here we see a major London street, you know, perhaps it was Regent Street or Oxford Street from a high vantage point with buses below, with the silhouettes of passengers. And, and I think here is Lil at her best with, with bold cutting of the blocks and attention to details uh, comparable to Cyril Power in his liner cut called Appy Amstead. Uh, interesting is that this scene will be repeated in London and elsewhere in the UK in early June this year as we celebrate Elizabeth's 70th year as our queen. And as you will see, it was also chosen as the cover for this, uh, this wonderful monograph that has been uh, published by uh, the Museum in Zurich. And this is a Parisian cafe. So by 1939, she was back in her native Switzerland. And like the rest of Europe, held their breath as World War II began on the 1st of September 1939. So perhaps uh, it is a look back to happier days during her time in Paris. So here in the foreground, we see a, a man reading his newspaper, uh, cars driving down the boulevard whilst people amble along the pavement. 
The cafe is the center of social life in Paris and was also depicted by Lil's friend uh, Edith Lawrence um, in, in the Paris Cafe, or French Cafe, I think it was called, um, who was also Flight's companion and partner, as we'd say today. Another grown the colleague, William Greengrass, also cut a similar subject, albeit a very English version called Tea Under the Umbrellas in 1934. Lil's version of this cafe scene is the very essence of Parisian life with umbrellas in red and white stripes with matching chairs, a coffee cup in the foreground as the waiters go about their business. It is sophisticated and highly accomplished. I think that's the last one I was going to talk about. So yes, sir. Alexandra. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much, Gordon, for this very interesting, interesting input. Uh, maybe you can tell at the beginning, how did you come across Lil Chudi? What was there a key experience you can remember? Well, I think I might have told this story before, but I was a, a partner in the Redfern Gallery, and it was the early 1980s, 1983, I think. And underneath the stairs were uh, an old plan chest of prints. Nobody had touched it for, since the 50s, I think. And it was the summer of 83, and I thought, well, I've got to sort this out. And so I, we closed the gallery for two weeks just to stock take or inventory. And um, I took everything out of the drawers and I put it uh, on some tables and I catalogued everything. And amongst them, I found about 10 prints, not a little shooty, but there was a, some Cyril Powers, Claude Flight, uh, Edith Lawrence, and uh, uh, Ethel Spars. And I wrote about them, I researched them, and, and I wrote, uh, uh, I did a catalog of British prints from 1914 to 1939, and included uh, Wentz and Wither. And it was hanging on the wall, and an elderly gentleman came along and looked at it, and I got off my chair and I started telling him all about Cyril Power, and he nodded. And eventually he turned around and looked at me and he said, I know all about Cyril Power. And I said, do you? And he said, yes, he was my father. Oh, <laughs> incredible. Uh, okay. Uh, I, so I went to visit him in, in Oxford and uh, bought some prints from him. This was 1983, uh, 84 actually. And he then uh, put me in touch with his brother, um, who was called Edmund, or Kit, as we all knew him, and he had all the prints. So I started really delving into the, into the Grosvenor School liner cuts. And in 1985, I did a show which included 105 liner cuts of the Grosvenor School, a number of which were Lil Shudis. Mm -hmm. And um, Michael Parkin, of course, was the, you know, he was the person that rediscovered them in 1973. And... You know, when you go into a if you were given free reign in the supermarket that you can have anything that you want, and you go to the shelves and you put everything that you can into the basket, things fall on the floor. But with the lino cuts, what I did was I picked up from the floor all the things that Michael left and didn't have time to deal with. And that's how I started dealing with them. And I, from this big show in 1985, and, and I've carried on since then. Have you ever met her? I corresponded with her and I, uh, through Donald Matter, who was her nephew, yeah, yeah. but I, I never ever met her. But one of my great friends is a man called Nigel Farrow, who is the, the chairman of Lund Humphreys Publishing. And during the 90s, he had a gallery in London called Coram Gallery. And he went to Lille, met her, and had a show of hers at Coram Gallery. And that was the first showing in London I think she'd had since since the 30s, since the 1930s. So I never met her, sadly. And I never yeah. met Sybil Andrews, although I dealt with her and corresponded with her. So my main contact was with um, uh, Kit Power, who was the, the third son of Cyril, who had all the prints. So that, that's how I really uh, began my interest in this and continue to, to do so. I, I think um, 
several sheets of Lil Trudy have already passed through your hands and mm. what makes them rele relevant for people or for you? I think I, I, you know, I, I've shown them in print fairs since 1985 when the first London mm. print fair started. And I think it's because they are the vintage, they, yeah. they are um, very modernist, they're very decorative, they're very colorful, and above all, they're very avant-garde. And, and I think that attracts a very, very wide audience. And whenever I've shown them, I get a, a huge crowd of people coming to look at them. And every time I show them, I, I get people who've never seen them before, who are, mm, yeah. there's an immediate attraction about them. That's, that's absolutely true. Mm. That's the same um, experience we make with our exhibition. The people yeah. are kind of happy <laughs> if they say they. Well, I, I hope her, her reputation broadens in, in, yeah. in Switzerland and she becomes as well known as Max Bill or Giacometti. That would be good, wouldn't it? Well, well. <laughs> Can I um, uh, cut in uh, with some comments? So yeah. you mentioned, um, I mean, it's uh, clear um, that uh, fixing the uh, wires is a um, very important um, mm. uh, piece. And actually Jennifer came up uh, for her five pictures with that too. And I told her, sorry, but Gordon already <laughs> took it away. I'd love to hear Jennifer's input on that as well. <laughs> but um, as we know, that this is um, the print that is also at the Museum of Modern Art and in most of the col big collections, mm. it, is, it, is, um, uh, it, it brings together uh, 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 a situation that we've seen way before though, um, the, the starting with communication, telephone lines and so on. Um, but I've never seen, it, it's the best one. I've seen about mm. 20 of those uh, different uh, artists who did that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and she brings it in a way together that it's just marvelous. And uh, what I wanted to find out is, you, the, um, you said, um, and we know that there was an American edition. What mm -hmm. did that do to, um, uh, it was flooding the market in a way, right? Um, uh, did, did something change that situation or the people said, no, I want to have the original one and not the later on edition or uh, how, how, how was the reaction to, to that kind of thing that you reprint from the same plate um, a subject again, another well, 50 or whatever it was? When, when they made the prints, they were made in very, very small batches of, I should think, probably, you know, five or up to ten, maybe less. Because I remember Cyril Power's son, Kit, telling me that when he was a, a teenager, he helped his father uh, to make these uh, during his school holidays. And he said the most we could make from, from breakfast time until supper time was about eight, depending on what they were. So the, the uh, Rex Nankerville was, was very entrepreneurial. You know, he was the... Um, the, the main person at the Redfern Gallery during the, the 1930s. And he put on all these shows. And he, there were certain prints like um, Cyril Power's uh, tube station um, that he thought was going to be a seller. And he thought that Shudi's Fixing the Wires would also sell, uh, which it did. And she began the second edition probably with his encouragement in 1937. But when you think there's only 60 in, in the first edition and 60 in the second, 120 overall in today's world is pretty rare. I mean, it's pretty small. So uh, it, it may be a second edition, but it's sort of, I, I should think she carried on the first edition till about 1937 or 36 and then started the second edition, which was numbered one to 60, I think, uh, US, and then annotated USA. But yeah, they're but identical to the, well, almost identical, each one is 
unique because they're hand printed, but you know they have a continuity from from the first number one in the first edition right through to number sixty in the second edition. Yeah, um, I, 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 since um, we have the logbooks of uh, the prints, uh, I saw that this was uh, very fast sold out, the first mm. 50. Yeah. Um, uh, not, but 50, not 60, sorry. In, in other cases, it was went very s slow or mm. sometimes um she stopped with mm -hmm. at 15 or something mm -hmm. like that so but, she never finished but that was sort of the best seller and um uh, a very important piece but i have some other com comments to make about um i was surprised that you picked the parisian cafe because i i thought th for me it was like too static in a way and in our show, just sort of like as a remark, mm. I try to pimp it up with uh, the newsstand where you buy the paper and right next mm. to it mm -hmm. where the man goes over and finally read it, you know. Mm. So I, I try to make a little story um, going on. Um, and, and the other thing I noticed, you already mentioned it yourself, that out of five pictures, you're, you're three or three from London, you know, so well, I, 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 very I, I, patriotic. I, well, it was, I mean, I would, the like, to, I, I would like to have picked Hyde, um, uh, Hyde Park as well. What was it called, Hyde Park? Or uh, London Buses, mm -hmm. because yeah. that's fantastic. That's Piccadilly Circus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it will show up uh, later on. Later. So let's would, go on to Jennifer. Yes, I would now like to move on to the remarks of Jennifer and give the word to you. It's your. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you, Alexandra and Marcel. This is such an honor. Your, your catalog is absolutely fantastic. And I'm so sad that I'm unable to see the, um, see the exhibition. I mean, I haven't really left my apartment for the past two months. So um, a trip to Zurich, unfortunately, is out of the, the question. But I, I've seen um, photos, and it's such an important thing that you're doing. And your book is absolutely fantastic. Um, if anyone's listening from New York, it's available in the Mets gift shop. It, we were very, very pleased and proud to to have that. And it's a great honor to be on with Gordon, who um, he and Stephen Koppel really um, wrote the book. Um, I think uh, to go back to how we discovered lino cuts, I first saw the British lino cuts in uh, Les Garfield, through Les Garfield. And then I immediately went and read Stephen's book, which is just the Bible and made um, pre-Google. And I cannot imagine the amount of work that went into that. And it still is just the, the reference. And um, I learned so much from every time I hear them talk. Um, to get to your question about why Shudi and why now, um, I think this speaks to the whole Grosvenor School movement. There are four main thoughts that I came up with. Um, I studied with Stanley Aronowitz and he said every talk should have four points. So um, the first would be the, the visual elements of the work. As Gordon said, they are incredibly dynamic. They're like nothing else. They both appear in a sense vintage and in a sense totally contemporary and totally timeless. And the freshness of, of the work um, and especially the works that we were able to acquire from less where the colors look just so vibrant and such wonderful condition. It really just makes uh, such a dynamic visual element. Um, the second would be the, um, the time the works were made. I mean, these, the, the period in which uh, the Grosvenor School was opened um, and these artists worked really bracketed by two, two world wars. And I keep thinking of, um, of when they started, um, you know, at the end of, uh, in between the wars and at the end of World War One, when, you know, four empires fell. So that must have just been uh, really the world turned upside down. And as Gordon showed, of course, um, 
George's, uh, the Jubilee. And of course, um, by the time the work was printed, um, Edward had abdicated. <laughs> and so you had your own kind of uh, constitutional crisis going on. So, um, you know, we know how the story turned out now, but at the time it was probably very much up in the air. So that idea of this incredibly tumultuous time, and then also what is the appropriate role of an artist? What is an artist to do? This is the moment when, um, film and photography are so dominant and to make works that are resolutely handmade but also engaging modern life and as the subject matter is the true subject matter is such a contradiction i mean you think of rochenko declaring the end of painting in 1921 so if painting's gone i mean god knows handmade printmaking i mean really printmaking is didn't even enter the conversation to go um so that itself is um is something um, the engagement with modern life, the, as Gordon so wonderfully spoke about, um, the, um, the prints, uh, you know, we can think about this kind of technological revolution of what was going on of seeing the landscape changing with telephone and telegraph poles being created and of, of communication and of uh, the BBC was created. I mean, all these things really changing and of movies. Um, you know, I, I focused on France and post-war. So, you know, we always think of Guy Debord and spectacle culture as being a post-war phenomenon. And it really began much earlier. I mean, just the attendance at movies and the newsreels and the, the print culture, um, meaning journalism and photography, I think are so dominant in the way these artists engaged it. And the last point would be, um, the role of prints. And I think that's one reason where we always talk about why is this not better known as because prints aren't taught, prints are not studied, they're not appreciated the way they should be. And, and we all know this. Um, and I think that prints, especially these prints are, they're not the unique work in the sense of, of painting, but they are, um, or drawing, but they are certainly not the reproducible work in the way of uh, photography. So it was in this kind of in-between zone because they are resolutely handmade either by intent or by um, by uh, just the fact that they are handmade. So perhaps we can start with the, the first image. So this is um, Jazz Band, which I selected on the left and, and Marcel added Foxtrot, which I think is a great, great comparison. And I think these works really show this engagement with contemporary life. And again, as I was speaking about the spectacle, the um, interest in entertainment became so dominant, which seems really, really at odds with the fact that there was a, a depression or a slump at this, this moment. And uh, I think that's so interesting because you see this very hyper elegant art deco kind of a quality that is shown um, especially with the really almost acidic colors of jazz band and the very compressed space. Um, one other thing that really draws me to the work is the foxtrot on the left and with part of the words cut out, um, the F or the, cup, the letters missing. And I think it's so interesting the way Shudi uses language. And I could be wrong, but I think she's the only one of the group that engages signage and language to the extent that she does. So she's essentially creating a kind of collage in prints and almost going back with the layering as Marcel talked about with the Paris newsstand, um, almost going back to Manet's Portrait of Zola or something and the layering of images. And of course this is, uh, several decades after the invention of collage and papier collé, but to try to realize it on a two-dimensional surface, I think is really um, quite something in, in the way that they do. Um, and again, the the use of, it's an almost cinematic quality, I think you see in Foxtrot, which brings up the, the love of movies. And of course, Lil, I believe was unique in making an image of a contemporary actor with Clive Brooks in the circus, um, which both of these works were in the show. I think we showed the experimental proof for acrobats where it's a yellow and blue, and this is the published edition. 
Um, I think this is a really dynamic, wonderful uh, work. Uh, Lil's work is on the left. Uh, you can see just these almost like thumbprints indicating the rows of spectators uh, watching this performance and um, just the rise of circus at this time, which of course is not new, it was a 19th century, um, very active in the 19th century and as shown with Degas and others, but uh, taking on a kind of renewed um, sense of modernity in the interwar period. And uh, one thing I hadn't been aware of was this kind of uh, nationalistic debate over the origin of the circus between Britain and France and the United States, all claiming it as unique to their culture and as this um, democratic space. And I do think that's something about the intermingling of, of classes and genders and people from uh, various places. Um, the circus of, it also recalls for me the great love of the circus that um, Leger had. And of course, Shudi studied with Leger and his um, depiction of, of the circus. And to compare it to Power, who made his work about three years after hers, um, Shudi's forms appear just incredibly um, solid, almost architectural, almost abstract, looking at the performer's legs on the bottom that appears almost, if it was removed from the context, I think it would be read as a completely abstract work. Um, whereas with Powers, one clearly sees the outline of the figures. One can make out hair, feet, knees, etc. Um, they look, in Power's case, almost like uh, cut with a knife. They look at, well, they were cut, but um, they have a, a very sharp edge, whereas shooties look almost sculpted in a sense. There's this um, quality of almost being clay-like, I think, despite the solidity. And they seem almost grounded, um, even though they're clearly up in the air and elevated. Whereas Powers, I think, almost has a sense of being incredibly um, precarious, and it seems to anticipate his um, print and monotype of uh, air raid, um, something that he witnessed when he was serving in, in World War I, of the planes being downed. And we can think of that, you know, 32, 33, you already have refugees coming in to fleeing Nazi Germany. And um, so you do have the the sense of the world being very much in, in turmoil. And I think power captures that. And um, I think that Schutte's is almost a reaction on the other sense of amplifying connections and this solid uh, quality. Um, the lights I think are just absolutely incredible the way they cut through the surface. And I think that this is, if we didn't have the title, this would be one of her, her most abstract pieces. Um, if we could continue, please. Okay, sticking up posters. Well, for me, this was an absolute uh, natural choice because uh, I wrote my dissertation on Daniel Buren, who of course um, is very well known for his use of paste to paper um, illegally in When Attitudes Become Form in Switzerland in 1969, for which he was actually arrested. So the idea of where posting uh, public pa posters are allowed, where they're not allowed, how they're authorized, uh, what messages they can convey is has long been an interest for, for me. Um, and so this idea of, um, of the authorized spaces in, in Paris, where one is allowed to uh, post these messages, as well as this kind of layering um, that the decollage artists in the post-war period, such as Hans and uh, Villa Glay, would later take up this kind of anti-Matisse layering. Uh, here you can see this wonderful kind of, um, again, layering of images. And you see her making these very strategic choices of uh, eliminating text so we don't have any identifying factors. And aside from the cigarettes that are on the upper right, one wouldn't really um, notice uh, what this was for, what the advertisements uh, necessarily were. Um, and just looking at this, you know, for some reason, I'm noticing just how narrow the top of the ladder is. And it seems almost to be puncturing the, the wall, which is something 
that I think I hadn't noticed that dimension of just how physical it feels like it, you almost feel like the surface has a dent in it from the way she's depicted the um, ladder with this three-dimensionality. Um, the play of the forms of the, the men, I assume they're men, um, uh, installing the posters against the, the rungs of the ladder and the shadows and the geometric components um, on the wall. All of this is just an incredibly uh, sophisticated uh, take, uh, very similar to fixing the wires in the sense that um, in the sense that you are um, really seeing what Flight described as the everyday, the common experience or the everyday through the eyes of this, this really gifted artist becoming something that's incredible. Um, we're lucky enough to have several of Shudi's uh, sketches and sketchbooks, these working drawings. And what's interesting is that you can see on the left, the drawing is oriented towards how the print will be, the final print will be realized. Whereas with some other ones, they show it in, in reverse. So you can see her moving uh, back and forth with the process. And these great dynamic lines that she uses in this process of working out the, um, the composition. If we could have the next image, please. Okay, Tour de Suisse, this is just, Absolutely fantastic. I think Marcel and Alexandra with their uh, research into Shudi and the uh, photographic albums just added so much information that I wish I'd had before <laughs> I wrote the book because it's it's really fascinating seeing these kind of uh, images almost collaged together, the sense of motion, because on one hand it appears almost like um, a single group of riders, almost like a Moybridge unfolding, but this um, this band is so incredible. Um, she's essentially turning the human into the machine, so I think that's the idea between man and the machine is something that comes into play, even with their active prints. And um, you can see this is a, a rare um, impression of Tour de Suisse because it has the dotted lines around it, which indicates that this was probably um, conceived of or was conceived of to be um, a decorative print. So it was to be um, placed on fabric for, I believe, a cushion. Um, so this idea of collapsing the distinctions between um, art in the sense of something sold in a gallery and shown in a more traditional museum and one's life of, um, you know, one's um, apartment or, or a restaurant or this kind of interior design, I think is very, um, very contemporary. It certainly was of its time, of course, this is what the Bauhaus and Soviet schools were investigating, but I think and Gordon perhaps could speak to this, that it seems like it also has a long history in, in England, going back to the Omega and then the, um, the Rebel Workshop. So it's certainly perhaps the hard and fast um, kind of division between art versus craft um, wasn't as strong as it was felt in the, the post-war period in, in the United States, for example. And here you go, Gordon, <laughs> here's <laughs> London buses. Um, it's funny because I feel like Gordon scooped me with some of the images. So <laughs> um, this is a work that I, is absolutely fantastic to, and I think it, it's just such a, a, a moving work. It both is a work that to me uh, concurrently looks back as a wonderful kind of reference to um, Claude Flight, of course, with, um, with speed and um, the, the red London buses, which for so many artists, going back to the futurists, really signified modernity. The idea of the buses racing through London, in this color. And, um, and I think that Shudi captures that, but you know, I mean, there's a sense in uh, flights that even though people are present, there's a sense of the bus moving perhaps, especially with the letters of speed for the bus on the side. Whereas in Shooties, 
I just see traffic. Maybe it's because I'm a New Yorker and I'm used to a lot of traffic, but I just see the, the crosswalks and the navigation and even the, the, um, the crossing guard seems to have given up and just be standing there, whereas uh, flights is much more actively engaged. Um, and so there's that, there's a kind of anti-speed in a sense. And then at the same time, um, it's, really almost overrun with signage. I mean, this you see a uh, flight engaging lettering, um, but you see uh, this almost kind of pop-like engagement with um, Piccadilly. And it, to me, this also very much anticipates Dieter Roth's Piccadilly series, um, where based on a picture postcard given to him by Richard Hamilton's, uh, or that he saw in the collection of Richard Hamilton's wife. And I think that idea of using language as well as the visual element of what the buses represent. And again, the, you know, it's hard to think of a more kind of um, communal experience than buses and subways and transportation where you're gathered together in these confined spaces and this idea of metropolitan modern life. So it's, um, I'm looking for, there's a wonderful line of, uh, with this, um, because uh, this is one of, Gordon spoke about, and, and Marcel spoke about the relationship between flight and um, little shooty. And this work was um, made in 49. Again, this is after the Second World War. So we can think about that and, the, and what this, how the city had changed and the, the bombing, the effect it had, as well as people having survived two wars. Um, but uh, she sent it in 1950 to Edith Lawrence, the artist Edith Lawrence, who was also Flight's partner and Claude Flight. And Edith Lawrence wrote her back and claimed that she and Flight, quote, we're so delighted with your lino cuts. They really are splendid, both so different and both so typical of London and France. Perhaps we can move forward one because we can see the, the French image. Um, and that, yeah, the, the long decay. Um, I think on the whole, I prefer the London one because it is more subtle, but you've got, you have got your experience across marvelously in both of them. And of course, as always, you're an absolute master of the medium. We show them to whomever we can who are likely to be interested here and everyone is most enthusiastic. And um, I think that's my last image and we can stop with this because I think it's a wonderful kind of connection um, of Shudi both with the past and anticipating the future. Um, I, I, I want to say something uh, about uh, about these two um, pictures because um, you actually didn't have that in the beginning and um, then I, I put the French one too. And I think for me is this, this are the two sort of brother or sister pictures at the end of Stephen Copel's uh, work catalog. And um, even though there, there's more figurative stuff uh, coming up later on, but um, it, it takes till 55 when she really turns into abstraction. But for me, this, this, is, this, uh, this is the homage mm -hmm. at the two um, cities where she went to school. Grosvenor mm -hmm. School in London and um, and to 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 Lot and and Severini and so on and and Fernand Leger in Paris. This is sort of like the end almost mm -hmm. that she says this this is it. Those were the two guidelines, and now mm -hmm. I'm gonna sort of like go slowly in another direction. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, but you you were talking about um, lettering. And do you know what Bovril is? It's a meat extract, isn't it? Yeah, you yeah. Know, but mm -hmm. most people don't know because it's not I known had to in look Switzerland. It up. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's and, <laughs> and somehow it looks like a barrel or something. Um, yeah, this round thing. And the interesting thing in the combination before with um, speed, which is very early. This is like the big span of between mm -hmm. 22 and 49. And weirdly enough, um, already the architecture 
in, um, uh, in, 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 in speed already somehow shows the streamlining of the buildings and um, with the London buses, we have the streamlining of the buses, you know, mm -hmm. so everything is round and sort of like um, uh, 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 not edgy anymore. And uh, I always found that interesting that it, the, it speed um, was sort of ahead uh, mm -hmm. with that kind of idea. And, um, and then it happens. And that's like, what, the span of more than 20 years, you know? Right. And it was probably Flight's um, best known known work. It was on the cover of his book. So the people would have seen it through reproduction, too. So I think it was a very strategic choice that she chose to look back, you know, the work she chose. Everybody else with comments? Yes, I, I, I know Metropolitan holds some 120 works mm. by Lil Judy, <laughs> and uh, it's because the great donation of the Garfields. Maybe you can tell something about these uh, two collectors. Yeah, they're absolutely just um, amazing, amazing people. Um, Les and Joe. Joe jo passed away sadly this summer, but she and um, Les were very active in jointly building this, this collection. Um, they're very close to Stephen Koppel and um, can, I think, quote his book. And um, they also worked with Gordon and uh, Mary Ryan, it largely. They also bought from a lot of auctions. So we do have a lot of really great firsthand material from the estate of Edith Lawrence and other places. So it really is what they assembled is really not only an art collection, but letters and sketchbooks and tools and um, even journals where um, works were, you know, contemporary magazines where the works were featured. And, you know, I've said this to everyone, if anyone's looking for a dissertation topic, this is an amazing piece of work and subject. And one thing that I'm always shocked by, and I've gotten letters from people who focus on English modernism, but they focus on literature primarily, and they were largely unaware of this work. You know, they might know Nevinson because I think they're so yeah. reproduced with the war, but, um, but especially the Grosvenor School as a group, it's not, um, it's not studied, it's not taught. And, um, and I'm, I was shocked in doing research for the show that even, books dedicated to England in the 30s or Great Britain in the 30s would have almost no mention of the work. And so to me, it's, it's a fascinating topic that really deserves multiple uh, theses. And of course, I would put Lil Shooty at the top of that list because of uh, something Marcel talked about, not only the work, which is incredible, but um, her interactions in London and as well as in Paris and the people she studied with and worked with. And I think it's really um, a fascinating response to these two cities at a particular moment in time. Why, why, yeah. why do you think she is so uh, not known in her own country and, and in Europe generally? I mean, I touched upon the fact that the, the exhibitions that, that Rex Nankervell organized during the, the 30s mainly went to America. It went to China, to Shanghai, which was one of the great cities of the world during the 30s. Uh, then you have the three Australian women who took the, took the prints, communicated with flight um, and said, you know, uh, Ethel would say, oh, I've got a show at Melbourne Library for, for, for all of us. Claude, would you like to get the gang together and send the stuff out? But there was no no inroad into Europe whatsoever at that time. And I just wondered why, you know, that maybe they just, they just didn't do it. It was just the English speaking world. Yeah. And, and then in well, 1953, well, Re Rex Nankabel, who was a New Zealander himself from Christchurch, gave a whole collection of the lino cuts to, um, to his native city. Yeah. So that's why there's such a huge collection there. And then he, um, he also collected, um, Australiana, everything to do with uh, Australasia. 
uh, and the South Pacific, mm -hmm. and eventually sold the whole collection to uh, to Australia for a very small sum, uh, a modest sum, and and got knighted for it and became Sir Rex Mankerville in 1975, I think it was. But he he did he used to go to Paris quite a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he used to to buy prints in Paris and. But never tried to to promote these things in Paris at all. I'm just um, so surprised at that. Well, you see, everything was channeled through Claude Flight. That was like the basic thing. Um, so, and Claude Flight was sort of distributing that everywhere, and she was just. Um, uh, a, a country pumpkin and in 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 Glarus in Schwanden mm. and there I think this stuff was not really um understood you know I mean they were not people oriented to big city life or mm. and you when you look at the you know I looked at the gra at the graphic uh, um collection of the ETH um, uh, through a lot of stuff. And you hardly see, for example, sports as a subject. You mm. um, and, and most of them were in Paris, not in London, but they were in Paris at one time. But you never even see an Eiffel Tower, mm -hmm. you know? Or if you see a car, you know, I'm, I'm jumping up in the air, you know? They come back home and they do um, still lives and landscapes mostly. Yeah, yeah. Or th then there is another part and they do sort of political um, stuff, riots and, and things like that. What happened here in, in, in Switzerland, strike pictures and sort of left wing um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, things that sort of like took up the workers um, uh, uh, situation, you know, fighting for less hours and, and better pay and, and so on. But this yes. kind of joie de vivre um, mm -hmm. of Paris was almost probably in those places decadent. Or Maybe we can take up this point again later we are right uh, we are running out of the time and we have one question to these two pictures here on the slide maybe i can um, put it here uh, the question is in the two examples of 1949 judy has depic depicted the sceneries from a high focal point this reminds uh, this um, this person who write writers of paintings of, for example, Monet, Boulevard de Capucine. Do you happen to know if Judy was inspired by impressionist painters when doing so? Yeah, I can, can everybody, can uh, uh, I, any? I, mean, I would say, I mean, she probably, I mean, definitely went to the museums and mm -hmm. when she was in Paris, I would think, but a more um, recent example would be, you know, you think of the photography coming out of the Bauhaus and coming out of uh, the Soviet Union with the bird's eye view and the worm's eye view and this uh, kind of the disorientation of the bird's eye view, you know, the Ostronani, I think is, is in play here. But we also had Wadsworth taking a elevated view earlier, um, it, the, the British vorticist, um, when yeah. for some of his doc mm -hmm. works. So it, it, this might just reflect where her studio was, where her vantage point was. And in the photography, I think. Uh, yeah, I think photography and film, um, I know that um, in one of Gordon's publications, the author wrote quite a bit about it with avant-garde film, which is great. But I wonder about more um, popular commercial film too, you know, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. the angles and the pacing. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. So, so Mar Marcel, would you like to yeah. start with your input? Yeah. So um, I thought that you can't mind, I knew of course, um, what you selected and um, that you were basically staying in the classic range of the iconic pictures, um, which were done uh, mostly 
besides London buses, um, between um, her beginning year, 1930, and up till 1939. Those nine years are basically uh, uh, the, the main focus here. So um, some of my stuff is uh, falls in that period too, but I I I think you said everything I can't I don't want to repeat. So I put something totally different. I, I selected something entirely different, and um, uh, in the, in the approach. So let's go to the first picture, and some people know it: <laughs> um, uh, uh, workmen or street workers. This piece um, exists just in one 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 existing um, uh, lino cut is in Miami Beach, uh, bought from as you can read here, uh, bought from uh, Mitchell Wolfson Jr. Uh, from Michael Parkin. And um, Mitchell Wolfson Jr. is a, I mean, he's, he's a brilliant man. I've met him once and, and he just knows like what to pick, you know. Mm. And this, I was always wondering why did she destroy this uh, prints? I mean, it's not a bad print. Um, you see the lorry, the tires are looking great and and you see the loading uh, some stuff, some gravel or whatnot. And um, uh, it's, it's wonderful. And she crosses it through, but it looks like it's indicated that um, some three pieces went to Claude Flight. Um, they're probably lost, or I don't know, or they never sent. Then number 10, she says she burnt it. And when it says Mia, uh, it means she kept it to herself, but nobody, no, probably she threw them away. And mostly when she crosses, she destroys the, um, the, the, the linoleum um, uh, thing away. And um, so, but then it says um, number eight from the 50 existiert wegen the color uh, it, 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 it exists because of the color, um, uh, the, the way she put the colors together. But what do we do with that information? We don't know. But you see a page of, um, of uh, uh, Lil Judy's handwriting. It, um, it always says um, it was 35 francs. Uh, on the left, upper left, you see the price, and then it says when it's done, April 1937. And uh, sometimes it just can't follow all the information, what it may actually means, you know. But as we know now, um, uh, this, this piece never popped up again. And we go to the next, next one, another one, um, another mystery. Next picture, please. So this is um, called Carousel. And you, sit, you see all these uh, people hanging in a seat uh, that turns and, and, and it hangs on lines or strings or, uh, uh, and, and it and spins them around. And um, in her logbook, it existed, two prints. One to Claude Flight and one to her, herself. And this is the draft um, uh, on, on the left side we found in a sketchbook. So they never appeared. And, um, but obviously there must be a two uh, that she did. And this is, this is sometimes I was always wondering what is the decision to not produce this in a bigger way, was it too abstract um, already? It was, uh, what was it, 19, I, I have to put my glasses on, 1931, I think, yeah. Um, or um, the other one uh, with, the, with the street work, was it too conventional for her? Or what, what is the decision she made? And that, of course, we don't know because she, she has not really, really written um, 
uh, she noted the stuff, but she didn't write uh, about like what happened in her head. So we go to that next one, which I find interesting. Um, I find I found a series in one sketchbook of Lil Judy, and I immediately had to think of um, did she know about the vorticists? Because uh, on the left side you see uh, early Percy Wyndham Lewis, and, um, and and he did many times this sort of like. Uh, uh, faces or shapes or outlines uh, geometric in geometrical uh, sort of uh, hard edge uh, uh, a composition and um, so this is a mystery but she surprises me all the time that sometimes I see like three I think it's like three or four um, uh, drawings and that's the best one she does in a style that sort of goes in a other way. Did she know the word is this? We don't know. But this kind of discoveries um, I, I find uh, interesting and I'm wondering what you think about it. And uh, for the final two pictures, it's not her work, but I found new photographs. So here we have Lil on the left, close flight in the middle, and her sister Adrian to the to the right. Um, so I think this has never appeared before. Um, uh, or Gordon would say, "Yes, I know it, but no, I, I, I doubt it." I doubt it. Um, so so, uh, but it's a wonderful picture of her, and we have a last one as I say goodbye to this series. And here we have. Edith Lawrence, Claude Flight, and Lil. In, in, in Schwendi, they were building very close to Schwanden. It's a little bit further up. They um, built in 1932 a swimming pool, and they went there quite often. I've seen many pictures, but Lil Judy is hardly on the picture because she was always the photographer. Mm -hmm. She had a like. She bought a Leica or some, or or was a, it was a gift? I don't know. But she used the Leica for many years, and she was always the one that photographed. So we have her sister in a hundred and fifty uh, different outfits, but she is very rarely uh, uh, in the picture. And this is a, wonder, a wonderful um, end picture that you can sort of close like in the movies, you know, like you're up and then it's all black. That's it. Thank you very much, Marcel. That was very surprising. Uh, I would like to encourage um, our listeners to, if you got any question, please type it in the Q&A function so we can back, come back to, to your questions so thank you once again uh, gordon did you did you know the pictures i have never seen them before alexandra um absolutely fascinating um i wonder where the first one was um, obviously probably in switzerland because of the shutters so, so yeah, 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 in yeah london so where was it from Marcel? do you know it's it's in switzerland yeah it's in, switzerland. It's, it's in schwanden actually in it's, schwanden. it's it's around her house I mean, you see on this picture that you look at now, the, the, you know, it's, it's cut, of course, yeah. but the uh, shutters are there yeah. everywhere. Um, yeah. And this is on the balcony of the house yeah. where Lil lived. Mm. And um, uh, um, yeah, uh, there, there's lots of different pictures with um, Claude Flight um, uh, and Edith Lawrence visiting um, Switzerland. But um, the prints are very small, you know, and when you blow them up. Mm. So I look through all of them and those two work, I would say, um, uh, better than, than others. And um, unfortunately, they never went to the photographer, to professional photographers. There is mm. not, nothing like that. But uh, I'm wondering, uh, Gordon, do you come across a new material uh, 
do you can i don't know how how did it happen that you see new liner cuts or new artists uh, from this um, time how how did it come um uh, i haven't seen any new artists i mean the only person that um from this period i, I had a visit from the daughter of, of an artist um, called Colin Wyatt. And Colin Wyatt attended the Grosvenor School and a lot of his subjects were skiing because he was, if I remember correctly, he was president of the, 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 the British um, Ski Federation. Um, he was a champion skier, but he's the only other one that I've really come across. I mean, there were um, I'm trying to remember the name of the young woman, Pamela, um, who I can't remember her last name, who was a sort of protege of, uh, protege of flights, but nothing's really become of her. And then there's uh, Ursula Fuchs, um, who was also part of the school and a great friend of, uh, of Sybil Andrews, one of her closest friends, but there doesn't seem to be many prints of hers. And then there is uh, Leonard Beaumont, who was um, not part of the group. He, he attended the first exhibition in London in 1929. Uh, he came down from, uh, from Sheffield, where he was uh, a graphic artist for the uh, newspaper in Sheffield and saw the exhibition and wrote to flight. And then he was able to contribute a number of prints to subsequent exhibitions, but he was the only person who uh, wasn't part of, who didn't attend the Grosvenor School at all. So he's called Leonard Beaumont and very, very interesting work. And it's, there's quite a collection in the museum in Sheffield. But quite a lot of the other artists kind of fell by the wayside um, because, you know, the top seven, which, which Stephen writes about and, and catalogued in his, in his catalog resume are the ones that really, and, and more latterly, um, William Greengrass has come to the fore as well. But there just hasn't been the body of work to create a really interesting market commercially. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a commercial animal, so I have to try and find what there is in substance to, to create a market. And I think because if you if you have a, a print like Wentz and Wither or the Eight uh, or sticking up posters uh, or, or um, fixing the wires uh, and you have an edition of 50, you're able to, to buy one. Yeah. Uh, whereas the unique work um, you can't or if there's not enough of them, it doesn't really create a market. But would you say that not all liner cuts of by Lil Judy are really in this quality, I think, no? Uh, I completely agree, yes. I mean, you know, the, some of the portraits are totally uncommercial. Yeah. And uh, if, if they came up at auction, they fetch very little money. Yeah. Uh, as I said, also the same with the later work. In fact, I was going to ask both of you whether there was anything in her, her, her workbooks to, 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 to say what happened after 1949, because I've seen all the, the abstract liner cuts and the it's a, a completely, uh, you know, a, a ver very much a departure from what she was doing. Yeah. But it's commercially unviable, mm -hmm. even, mm -hmm. even now. Absolutely, I understand. Um, we have a question from our forum, and maybe it's the right question for the end of our talk. Do any of you have a favorite era of her work? Her work seems to be influenced by where she is living at the time. So maybe everybody should um, say what, uh, which, which uh, line of cut is the favorite one of each. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's a very, very difficult question, maybe. Jennifer, I'll give you first choice because I, I chose Victor <laughs> the Wise, so you got to go. <laughs> yeah, you can you, can answer, you can answer the big question of uh, telephone, telegraph, you know, wooden utility pole, how to describe uh, the structures. Um, I think uh, my favorite would probably be either underground um, or um, 
or putting up posters, sticking up posters. I think both of them are just so, uh, so much capture um, modern life. Mm -hmm. Well, Marcel? I, well, I would, I would take um, two or two threes and you, uh, you don't know why, because for me, that was the first picture I saw of Lil Judy. She was on the cover of a book that came out of yeah. the uh, Grafische Sammlung of the ETH. Maybe you of, know it. I don't know. It's basically, it says um, Swiss uh, woodcuts, yeah. but she is in there. Uh, modern, with, modern yeah. woodcuts. Yeah. Modern woodcuts. And, and she, is on the, she is on the cover all around. Yeah. And that's my first um, connection to her. Mm -hmm. And my second one was then when I was in England, I bought the, um, the Bible by Stephen Copel in late 90s. And from then on, I just sort of like bought whatever I found. I even was once at your gallery <laughs> and I bought your first paperback. Uh, okay. A booklet you you published you know and that was also about 20 years ago i guess okay uh, well i fall in love with uh, le porello with this accordion book that's really it was a image amazing uh, found we we did um, in the um, process of the research uh, and uh, i think that that would be my favorite i have a question i could uh, Pose to you. Uh, could one of you address the comparison with color wood cuts at the time, which, according to Koppel, had far more status? But we were there wood cuts made at the time with similar urban subjects and modernist style. Can you? I'm just trying to think. Um, answer this. I, I I think probably the wood cut was. Uh, is a much older process and a more accepted process. And I think when the liner cuts came along, um, it was derided somewhat and, and considered to be something that you teach children rather than, than an artistic form. I don't know. Um, Jennifer, do you think? Jennifer, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that they were on really two different tracks and the mm -hmm. fact that they're compared so much um often to the detriment of a lino cut but mm -hmm. um i imagine the lino cut artists because uh modernity you know mm -hmm. in not only subject but production even though it's relief print which is like the oldest printmaking technique it still is linoleum was still a relatively recent um recent con construction and using it in in art was really, um, really challenging the hierarchies and the systems. I mean, so much of it is that anyone could buy it and, um, and that anyone in theory could, could use it. Now, I think children use styrofoam a little bit more than, than linoleum. So I think that the idea of the color woodcut just, um, I know some of Flight's very, very early works mm -hmm. resemble the color woodcut, but I think for the really sinuous lines and the the bold colors and the, and the textures that could be achieved through linoleum, but they were also very, at least Flight was very clear about what linoleum meant. I mean, he was a socialist, so the idea of art for for the people, I think, was key. You mentioned once again modernity. I, I would like to close with uh, Bomo by Paul Valery. Modernity is an adventure without end, did he say? And I think this is a sentence that fits Lil Judy very well. I would like to thank everybody, thank the, the, our community, thank you for your attention um, on the many screens at home and for the interesting questions you send us. I would also like to thank the panelists for the stimulating and highly interesting discussion. Thank you so much, dear Jennifer, dear Gordon, dear Marcel. It was such a pleasure to have you with us and to share our thoughts with you. A pleasant evening to everybody and perhaps see you soon at our exhibition, which is, which is on show until 13 March. 
Thank you and goodbye. Bye bye.